couple of scriptures to share with you this morning. The first comes from Psalm 78, the first seven verses. Listen, my people, to my teaching. Tilt your ears towards the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a proverb. I'll declare riddles from days long gone, ones that we've heard and learned about, ones that our ancestors told us. We won't hide them from their descendants. We'll tell the next generation all about the praise due the Lord and his strength, the wondrous works God has done. He established a law for Jacob and set up instruction for Israel, ordering our ancestors to teach them to their children. This is so that the next generation and children not yet born will know these things, and so they can rise up and tell their children to put their hope in God, never forgetting God's deeds, but keeping God's commandments. And the second reading this morning comes from Joshua chapter 24. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, and he summoned the elders of Israel, its leaders, judges, and officers. They presented themselves before God. Then Joshua said to the entire people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors lived on the other side of the Euphrates. They served other gods. Among them was Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. I took Abraham, your ancestor, from the other side of the Euphrates. So now revere the Lord. Serve him honestly and faithfully. Put aside the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it seems wrong in your opinion to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Choose the gods whom your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But my family and I will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, God forbid that we ever leave the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord is our God. He is the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. He has done these mighty signs in our sight. He has protected us the whole way we've gone and in all the nations through which we've passed. The Lord has driven out all the nations before us, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you can't serve the Lord because he's a holy God. He is a jealous God. He won't forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you leave the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn around and do you harm and finish you off in spite of having done you good in the past. And the people said to Joshua, no, the Lord is the one we will serve. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. They said, We are witnesses. So now put aside the foreign gods that are among you. Focus your hearts on the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and will obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and established just rule for them at Shechem. Let's pray. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Amen. You know, sometimes when I read scripture, I have a hard time relating to it. I have a hard time relating to the story. For instance, I, I don't really know what it was like for Joseph to be thrown into a well by his brothers because I don't have brothers. I have a sister that threw me into a well. No, she never did. I, I can't relate to Paul's experience of being blinded and knocked to the ground by the Spirit. I've never had that kind of an experience of the Holy Spirit. I've never had a, a, a dramatic conversion experience like Paul did. And, and when I read all these stories in the Old Testament of military conquest, I have no frame of reference, especially when that story includes something as silly as, as the Jericho story where, where people decide they're going to march around a wall seven times and blow a trumpet and yell and then the wall collapses. I, I just feel like I'm always watching these stories from the outside and I have no way of really connecting because I don't really know if I've ever experienced something like that in my life. But today's story, I get that one because I think it's a story 
anybody could understand, even if it's the first time they're reading it, even if they don't know exactly what the context is. Because the story of Joshua and the Israelites at Shechem is really just a story about making choices, or making one choice in particular. But it's about making choices, which all of us do thousands of times a day, whether we realize it or not, right? We choose what to do and what to eat, what to say, who to talk to, where to go. Anyone can relate with a story about making choices, especially this week, right? But there's a couple of interesting things about choices when you think about it. And the interesting, uh, first interesting thing is that every choice also includes a not choice, which means every time we choose in favor of one thing, we are choosing against something else. Coke over Pepsi, pizza over Chinese food, watching TV, which means not reading a book. Choosing to go outside is also choosing to leave the inside. And choosing to talk with one of you after worship means that I'm choosing not to talk with the rest of you in that particular moment. Every choice has a not choice. And we have all these small decisions throughout our days, but this happens with big decisions too, right? Now, most of us, if we have to move, we will look at several houses, but we can only afford to buy and live in one. We can't buy all the houses that we like. Same with cars and jobs and elections. Eventually, we have to choose one. Yogi Berra once said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. But we know that's not possible. If you come to a fork in the road, you can't take both sides. You have to choose. Going left means you can't go right, and going right means you can't go left, and going nowhere is also a choice. It's a choice to stay where you are. You're still choosing even if you don't go left or right. A few years ago, I made a huge life-altering choice. I decided in 2012 to participate in a program through our annual conference that sent me to live in Zimbabwe for, over six, or for almost six weeks. And it was a choice that I made because it was one that I felt that God was, was asking me to make. It, it was something that, that I felt God was asking me to do, to spend time in a, another country, to learn how Christians in a different part of the world live out their faith. And I can tell you to this day, it's one of the best choices I've ever made. It was an amazing, life-changing experience. But that choice had consequences. Because when I chose to spend six weeks of my summer in Zimbabwe, I also was choosing to not do other things. I chose to not see my wife for six weeks and only talk to her maybe three or four times during that whole six weeks. I chose, and you all know this is a sacrifice, I chose to miss six weeks of a baseball season and one in which the Pirates were competitive that year too. It doesn't happen all the time. I chose to leave behind my phone and my computer I chose to leave the church I was serving at that time for half of the summer. But you know, the most difficult part of that choice was that as it came closer to the time of leaving, I became very aware that uh, my grandfather was dying and that it was very, very likely that he would die while I was away for those six weeks. And two days before I left, I made a visit to my grandfather, knowing that it was most likely the last time I would see him alive. And as it turns out, he did pass away while I was in Zimbabwe, about a week before I returned home. And so that meant that the funeral was actually the day that I flew out of Zimbabwe to come home, which meant that I missed it. I made this wonderful choice to follow God. And yet that choice meant that I also had chosen to miss my grandfather's final days of life and the funeral where the rest of the family was gathered. Every choice, big or small, involves a not choice. To choose one thing means not choosing another. Choices almost always include making sacrifices. And, you know, the interesting thing, too, about choices is that we often think about choices as choosing something good instead of something bad or evil, but that's not always how our decisions and our choices work. 
Now, when I went to Zimbabwe, most of the things I was choosing to do that over were also good things. Seeing my wife, using a laptop, working as a pastor in Pennsylvania are far from things I would call evil. They are all good things, but for that period of time, those good things, and even the good thing of being with my grandfather in his final days of life and being able to attend his funeral, those were good things that I just wasn't called to. Sometimes we're forced to make the best choice or make God's choice among several good options. Other times, God's choice is choosing the least bad choice among several options that all seem to be fraught with difficulty. And when we talk about choosing God's way, it's not just choosing a good versus evil path. Sometimes it is. But sometimes it's about choosing between what might be good and, and what might be right. What that means is that even good paths aren't always the right path for our particular moment in time. Choosing to follow and serve the Lord means choosing the right or correct path over other good paths sometimes. The Israelites of the Old Testament had chosen to follow God out of slavery. They had chosen to follow God into wilderness and through wilderness, and then finally they had chosen to enter into this land that God had promised them. They'd chosen to follow God into military conflict in that promised land, and now in this moment at the end of the book of Joshua, they finally are taking hold of that land promised to them. And this moment at Shechem is a critical moment where Joshua reminds them of all of these things that God has led them into and through. He, he goes through this litany of, of all these wonderful ways that God has, has kept them safe and protected them through this difficulty and then reminds them, you have a choice when it comes to your faith. You can serve that Lord who led you through. Or you can serve the gods of your ancestors and the gods of your new neighbors. That's your choice, Joshua says. Now, you don't need to know the context to understand this story, but a little bit of it is, is helpful. In, in the ancient Near East, choosing a god just wasn't a big deal. Polytheism was very common in those days, and so you could choose as many gods as you wanted, and did, it didn't conflict. You could have a whole collection of gods, just like you might collect shoes or baseball cards or spoons or antique guns. You're never going to need all of them, but you like having the collection. And that's how religion in the ancient Near East sometimes functioned. This idea of serving one God, having one Lord, it was a new and difficult one to understand and accept because it, choosing for the God of Abraham meant choosing against all the other gods. They'd never had to do that before. Like Joshua, I have made my choice and I make it every single day. Desiring to serve the God of Abraham and Moses revealed in Jesus the Christ, but people sometimes ask me about that choice, ask me why I've made the choice to follow the Lord, to call myself a Christian, to, to follow Jesus and serve the Lord. Well, it's not so that I can be a good person or a moral person or even, even a loving person, although it does help with all those things, doesn't it? I've discovered in life that there are lots of good and moral and loving people who follow different religious paths than this one, or who follow no religious path at all. And so serving the Lord has to have something more about it than just being a good or moral or loving person. Why not choose the gods of my ancestors or the, neighbor, or the gods of my neighbors or the gods who will let me share them with other gods rather than insisting I choose just one? Why does this god have to be so demanding? Why don't, why don't we get to choose this god and then choose a different god tomorrow and get to follow... Uh, whoever and whatever we want and get to collect all the things that we worship in our world. Why, why do we have to worship just one thing? Well, for me, the answer is simple. I choose to worship the Lord and no one and no thing else. 
for the same reason the Israelites did on that day. I choose the Lord because of what the Lord has already done for my ancestors. There are countless stories in the Bible and in history and even in my own life that tell of how God saved people from slavery or oppression, how God walked with people through the desert of their minds, how God gave hope in the most hopeless circumstances, and how God was a fountain of peace in war-torn countries and provided comfort and strength for people dealing with tragedy or illness or even death. There are times when the words of Psalm 124 ring true. Had the Lord not been on our side, we would have been swallowed up by our enemies and the waters would have drowned us. I choose the Lord because the Lord has rescued you and me and all people from slavery to sin and death, pouring out love and forgiveness on the cross and new life in resurrection. And we don't have to feel guilty anymore about our sin or forever be defined by our sin. We can release all of the things that bind us We can forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we've made, and we can forgive others for the ways that they hurt us. We can choose the Lord because of what the Lord has already done. I also choose the Lord because of what God is doing in my life right now. When I feel tired, God finds a way to give me rest. When I'm in conflict, God can bring peace. I've found Even in these moments when I'm lost, God shows me the way forward. And when I'm grieving, God weeps with me. When I am finding myself drowning in the chaos of life, especially in 2020, or I'm surrounded by temptations to sin, which is a daily struggle for all of us, God reaches out and rescues me, pulling me safely to dry land where I find a peace that passes all understanding. Now, all of these things that I've said about the Lord are things that cannot be said about pastors or politicians or celebrities because no pastor or politician or celebrity has the power to keep me going in hope and in faith the way that God does. It's the solid rock I stand on when all the gods of this world are sinking sand. And finally, I choose the Lord because of what God has yet to do After all, when you think about this moment in Joshua 24, it is both the end of a long story and also the beginning. The Israelites have been through hell and back over the course of several generations, but this moment at Shechem is still pregnant with joyful anticipation. The promised land, finally theirs. No more escaping slavery, no more wandering in the wilderness, no more bloody conflicts. But what will come of their inheritance remains to be seen. Like the Israelites, we have our own stories today of slavery and of racism, of lack of compassion for our neighbors, of fighting over what land belongs to who. And as we see now, division and factionalization about who the best person is to lead us. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same from the ancient Near East to the postmodern West. We're all trying to collect a bunch of gods instead of choosing one. And when tensions and crises arise, our choices and specifically our devotion to God can begin to waver. Maybe we don't fully abandon our hope and trust in the Lord in those moments, but we begin to doubt it at least. And that's why I believe we've been called to Shechem this morning along with the Israelites, just days after another contentious and polarized election. This story strikes at our core today. It demands conviction and courage from us to declare our commitment to and our trust in God, to choose to follow God no matter what adversity comes, no matter what other people say, and no matter how tempting it is to follow human leadership. But doing so means putting aside other gods. It means burying the other gods, as Jacob and his household literally did in Shechem, as we read in Genesis 35. It means making a choice, as the Israelites are forced to do in this moment today, and it means recognizing that even this choice, just as every other choice, is a not choice. Because in choosing God, we choose to not have other gods. In serving the Lord, we choose to serve only the Lord. 
which means we cannot serve people or nations or kingdoms of this world. We cannot make those things objects of our worship. And this decision is not one to be taking, taken lightly because from this choice will flow all the other choices in our lives. In fact, it may be the most important choice that we make each day. The choice is yours. Each day we end up at the fork in the road. And the choice is yours left or right, up or down, forward or backward, or standing still. And you might choose a good path, but just because you don't just because you choose a good path doesn't mean it's the correct one. It doesn't mean it's the God honoring one. And you know, if you want, you always have the choice to collect gods and objects of worship in this world as figurines on a shelf. But when we do that, it means choosing against the God who demands our full and total commitment and loyalty and heart. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me, I'll serve the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.